We are leaving John's Gospel this morning to go to Luke for a story that appears only there. It comes from the 24th chapter. And it begins now on that same day, and that is the day of our Lord's resurrection. We begin at chapter 24, verse 13. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near to the village to which they were going, he walked ahead of where, as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and their companions together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. People have been saying, what do you miss most during this time of isolation? I miss human contact. I haven't hugged a person or shaken a hand other than my dogs in quite a while now. But one of the other things I am missing greatly is baseball. I have not lived in the Baltimore area in 36 years, and I was looking forward to being at Camden Yards and seeing some games live for the first time in a long time, more than maybe one a year if I was lucky enough to get down here for that. And I remember even going to Memorial Stadium as a child. I remember being carried into Memorial Stadium as a child. And I remember when you're going in, that sense of excitement, the crowd is just a buzz. They're all expectant and hopeful, and there's just this great energy in the air until they lose a game, which the Orioles have sometimes been known to do. It's a different scene on the way out of the ballpark. People are not talking and laughing. People's heads are hanging low. People are sort of grumbling their way to their cars. It's a little bit like Easter evening for Cleopas and the unnamed disciple on the road to Emmaus. They're on foot, they're walking, they're dejected because as he says to Jesus, we had hoped he was the one only to find that their savior was killed, put into a tomb, and then, although the women said they had seen a vision of angels, they still did not believe. They were hopeless. And a stranger comes to them on the road. Now, I've said we hear the story of Easter just as a story of Christmas in a different way depending on our circumstances of life. Never have we experienced anything like we've experienced this Lent into Easter. Back before Easter, I put on my Facebook a meme that was going around. It said, of all the Lents, this is the Lentiest Lent I've ever Lented. And that is what it feels like now. We're still waiting for Easter. We're still waiting for that time of redemption. And we find ourselves maybe feeling like the disciples locked away in fear because we're afraid of the virus and what it will do if it gets into a body of people. 
Churches, unfortunately, and funerals and choirs have been a cause of the spread of the virus in other places. One of the reasons that both the governor and our bishop have decided that for now we worship remotely. We also find ourselves perhaps a little jealous of Cleopas and the unnamed disciple because they're on the road, they're walking, they're talking, and they meet a stranger. I don't know if they shook hands, but they're talking to a stranger. They are not observing safe distancing. They didn't have a mask on. And then as he prepares to go ahead, they say to him, come and stay with us. They invite him into the home where they are staying the night. And they sit at the table with him and they break bread. Now, the words sound familiar. It was in the breaking of the bread that he was made known to them. We'll get back to that in a little bit. But let's go back and talk about what they said on the road before they got to the place where they stayed for the night. They're walking along. They're talking about their broken hearts. They're talking about their dashed dreams and their hopes that have not been fulfilled. And a stranger says to them, what's up, guys? They look at him and they say, are you the only person who doesn't know what's happening? It would be like Jesus saying today, what virus? Everyone knew. The whole town of Jerusalem, and it was quite the city even in that time, the whole of the city was talking about the pretend son of God who had been nailed to the cross and buried. There were those who had hoped, they said, and they were among the hopeful because they had been with those disciples in Jerusalem. Indeed, they are disciples of Jesus until his body is gone and they cannot understand the women's testimony. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, who is also a bishop of the Church of England, an Anglican bishop, has written that part of the reason that we know that the story is true is because it was told by witnesses who were not considered to be worthy. No one would ever allow a woman to testify in a legal matter in that time. And so by having the Gospels, all four record that women were the first to arrive at the tomb, the first to share the news of his resurrection, that certainly this must be a true story. Otherwise, they would have had a better story planned out ahead of time. Jesus must be a little disappointed when they say, we had hoped he was the one. We had hoped, meaning their hope is no longer there. And he chastises them a bit and says, how slow of heart must you be? But then he begins to speak to them. He opens their minds to the scripture. He does something in his speech that stirs their hearts within them so that when they think he's going on ahead, they want him to stay with them. That's when we get to the dinner. Sounds like Holy Communion, doesn't it? He took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he shared it. But those are the same words that Jesus uses in that story from Luke of the crowd that gathered, that shared the bread and the fish. He took the bread, he gave thanks to God, he broke it. Whenever Christ comes to a meal, it doesn't have to be a sacrament, but he is made known to them in the sharing, in the hospitality, in the welcome, in the forgiving grace, that even though they had been doubtful, here he is still in their midst, staying with them, talking to them until finally they see him. We don't know why they couldn't recognize him. It's that they were kept from recognizing him. It doesn't necessarily mean that God prevented their vision, but it means that they weren't looking for him. They didn't expect to see him because they expected that he was dead and gone, even if someone had stolen his body, which was the rumor spread to make it look like a hoax. They couldn't see him because they didn't know that he had been raised until he broke the bread and their eyes were open, not the eyes in their head, the eyes of their hearts, and they could see that Christ was in their midst, and just as he had done in the locked room full of disciples, he was gone in a heartbeat. Now they had just walked, we heard about seven miles, from Jerusalem to Emmaus, but they were so excited, so overjoyed, so filled with wonder and so unable to hold on to that news any longer that they got up and they ran back another seven miles. They found the disciples and they, they were sharing the story of Peter seeing Jesus. They were sharing the story even in their fear and they greeted these two with what has become the great profession of Easter morning, the Lord is risen indeed. And then they shared about their encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. We can learn a lot from this story, even in our time of isolation. 
we can learn about what we're called to do as Christ's disciples until we can get back on the road again. Jesus asks them what happened, and they begin with the story of his death. They begin with the story of how he had been their hope. They begin with the story of his burial and the empty tomb, and that's the beginning of the practice. And then as he opens their minds to the scriptures, he begins at the beginning of the Hebrew scriptures. He talks to them about Moses. He shows them line by line how he is the fulfillment of the promises of old. And then they can't keep that story to themselves, and they go and they tell, and then they tell, and they tell, and they tell, and they tell until we tell it today. There's an interesting feature that's happened with remote worship. We are getting more people attending worship remotely online than in churches. That's a phenomenon that's being experienced all over the Christian church. And people are doing some research into it, and they're finding that agnostics, people who may believe but may doubt, sort of like Cleopas and the unnamed disciple on the road, are finding themselves pulled towards something, looking for answers, looking for meaning in what's happening. Even some folks who are sworn atheists have been checking out worship services to see what's going on. So we are being able to share the story. And another thing we're able to share is dinner, not together. And it breaks my heart not to have Holy Communion. I am a sacramentalist to my core. It breaks my heart not to be able to share with you the body and blood of Christ. But it enlivens my heart to hear what you're sharing around your table. One of the things that has been lost in American culture in the 21st century is family dinner. Because of schedules with sports and scouts and youth group and everything else, families are pulled in a hundred directions every day of the week. Choices have to be made. Now families are sitting down together, probably more than they ever hoped they would, but they're not taking it for granted anymore. Grandparents are gathering for Zoom meals. And just a few weeks ago, during the time of the Passover, Jewish families gathered with their relatives around the country and around the world and sat at table together because their hearts were joined by what they were celebrating, God's redemption of the Hebrew slaves from Egypt. Just as we sit at the Last Supper together and as we had a virtual love feast on Easter morning to remember that we are joined in heart even when we are not joined. Let me tell you something about family dinners. They're important. They're more important than we realized. There was a doctor. There is a doctor. She teaches at the Harvard Medical School her name is Ann Fischel, and she is co-founder of something called the Family Dinner Project. She's also a therapist, and what she writes is, as a family therapist, I have often had the impulse to tell families to go home and have dinner together rather than spending an hour with me. Studies have found that children who have dinner regularly with their parents around a table have better physical and mental health. They do better in school because they feel that someone is listening to them as they share together around the table in the evening. And we're called not to just share with each other, but to extend that hospitality to others. I have been so moved by those of you who have called to say, I am willing to go to the store and shop for anyone. And also those who have said, if someone cannot afford food, I am willing to go out and buy food and deliver it to them myself. We also are trying to find a way to safely gather and distribute food. We're looking at ways to do that here from Epworth Church as more of our neighbors cannot eat because they're not receiving any paycheck right now. I think the best part of the story, though, is what is true for us, especially now, that even when we don't recognize him, Jesus Christ is with us, just as he was with those unnamed disciples. Those unnamed disciples have lived through the ages. They're the ones who have carried the story of Jesus Christ from generation to generation around tables, in homeless shelters, in soup kitchens, in churches, in the office, in the schoolyard, wherever people gather, people are sharing Christ. I found something funny the other day on Facebook. There are a lot of funny things on Facebook. This was not the funny haha. This was the funny weird. Someone said that there is nothing of God on Facebook because those posts are taken down. Let me tell you, there's plenty about God on Facebook. I put a scripture verse up every single day of my life. And people are sharing their faith. They're sharing their hope. They're sharing the story of Christ's resurrecting love that transforms us and makes us new. I wonder if you, when you saw the sermon title, if you looked at the sermon title, it's called On the Road Again, if that song from Willie Nelson started to go through your head. 
It's a song that has been become sort of the national anthem of the road trip. And while we are waiting desperately, I love the Ocean City commercials that say, we're still here, stay home, we'll be here when you're ready to come back. When it's safe to come back, we will be here. We all long for vacations and being able to get out and sing with the windows open and without a mask on along with the radio. On the road again, I just can't wait to get back on the road again. We want to be out, we want to be together, we want to gather, we want, I want to preach to people and not looking in a camera lens. I want to see your faces smiling back at me or even frowning back at me. I would take that right now. But until that time, practice sharing the story, practice around your table, practice through social media. Call someone who is alone in this isolation time and share your faith in Jesus Christ, share yourself share all that you are and all that you have, and then you will find that Christ is next to you. Christ is within you. Christ is in the mirror when you look there because you are embodying his love, his grace, his peace, his truth. Because even when we don't recognize him, he is our companion, and that alone is cause to rejoice. Alleluia. Amen.